This episode of The Old Man and the Three is presented by BMW, the ultimate driving machine. Welcome to The Old Man of the Three with JJ Reddick and Tommy Alter, brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 232. Uh, Shaquille O'Deal, Shaq, and a special guest appearance for the New Era Draft with Sue Bird, OG, OM3 correspondent. I don't know why it's hitting me this morning. We've done a shit ton of podcasts. <laughs> yeah. I would say so. <laughs> 232. <laughs> no, it's, you know that's not funny? even including you know the hundred we uh, the hundred uh, I did before I was gonna, Old Man in the Three. I was gonna I've told this to you before and I've said it to Kylie before. And I, I was actually gonna say mention this to you this week. I've known you for a long time. As long as I've known you, you've been an extremely hard worker. You've been you've had an amazing NBA career. You're working about you're working <laughs> more now on this. Then you've done playing basketball. Like, I don't know that everybody at home understands what it takes to basically do two podcasts, two like uh, three, three, well, two and a half. The old man of the three things. Yeah. So the old so man of the three, two and a half game. to three. And then we were just talking about what games we're going to call this week. <laughs> It's like, I got to go to Dallas. I got to maybe go to Cleveland, maybe go to Boston. Like, it's just, it's a lot. You, but you know what? Summer's coming. And, uh, and it's fun. Yeah. And these games oh, are good. Yeah. This and is the, the games best time are good. Of year. And uh, well, actually, I, I flew down to Atlanta last week uh, for the day to go to Shaq's house to uh, his, you know, he's got a little content studio in his house. So we, uh, I jumped on his podcast uh, with Adam. Which and, is out now. Yeah, which is out uh, as of yesterday, I believe. And, we recorded this. Two very different conversations, by the way. I had a ton of fun on his, and uh, as uh, Jason Gallagher, I always know when it's a good episode if Jason Gallagher texts me because he's not always in the room. Uh, in this case, we used uh, Shaq's people that were there uh, to record the audio and video. Jason texted me Sunday night and said, damn, Shaq episode is good. You kind of yeah. undersold it. He's, I mean, it's a legend. It's a, it's a legend. It, he really is a legend, and I talk to him about that a lot. Yeah. Like, he he really is a legend. He's one of the GOATs, uh, one of the most dominant players. He wants the crown, and we'll get into that with him. He wants the crown of being the most dominant player ever. Before we get to him, let's do our DraftKings Sportsbook segment. I want to talk about the Timberwolves and the Nuggets. All right, so far, only three teams have advanced as of this recording. Obviously, games tonight with some teams that can close out. Uh, big game five. Uh, in LA with Dallas and and uh, and the Clippers, but Oklahoma City has advanced as the one seed. This matchup, the two three seed in the West, Minnesota Denver, I think uh, potentially the most fascinating second round matchup. These two teams played last year in the playoffs, um, and there's I, I think a lot to get into. Before we do that, real quick, just to win the West, the Nuggets right now are the odds on favorite at minus one fifteen, Thunder. At plus 330, Wolves plus 450, Mavs plus 700, Clips plus 1,000. Obviously, the health of Kawhi Leonard uh, for the rest of these playoffs uh, is a concern there. Uh, De- Luka is a little banged up as well. Uh, that second round series between the Thunder and whoever wins Dallas Mavs is going to be fascinating. But let's get into uh, the Nuggets and Wolves and do a little preview of this series. Uh, my first question for you on this, compared to the series last year, where Minnesota did not have Jaden McDaniels or Nas Reed, uh, that these guys split the season series this year 2-2. What is the... I want to get into the specific impact of those two guys, but but initially, what is the key thing that those guys are going to bring this year that they did not have last year? Uh, I think you have to match up with Denver with size. And Nas is a a, a big player. He's a, he's a four, can play some five. So they have a third big here. Uh, Cats coming off a really good series in that first round. Gobert defensively has been dominant. So the interior size is there. On the perimeter, uh, McDaniels, his size on Jamal Murray. If you go back to last year in the playoffs, uh, two things. Jamal Murray was awesome in that series. They didn't really have anybody that could guard him. Nikhil Alexander-Walker, I thought, took a huge step forward this year, just totally embracing his role as a pest and uh, a wing defender, point of attack defender. Uh, he he wasn't that player last year. And so I think those two guys are big keys in this series with Murray. The second thing on Murray, last year, uh, regardless of who was matched up with Jokic, 
they primarily played a heavy drop coverage. That's part of the reason Murray in that two-man action got so many pull-up jumpers. There was a couple times where they brought the big up. He just dumped it off to Jokic. They got either the France cut out of the corner or Aaron Gordon the dunker spot. So I would expect them to cross match as they've done almost, uh, you know, almost exclusively. I want to go through each game in a second, but I would expect them to cross match, go bear on Gordon, cat on Jokic, Nas Reed will get some action on Jokic, Kyle Anderson may get some action on Jokic. I'll get into that in a second. Um, and, and they will, will put McDaniels and, and Nikhil Alexander Walker on Jamal Murray. Now, key for that, Tommy is trying to get a different body on Jamal Murray. So maybe set a ball screen with Mike Conley's guy, maybe set a ball screen with Anthony Edwards guy, although he's a really good defender, like getting McDaniels off of Murray, going off the ball, setting a pin down into the dribble handoff. Like they've got to get the bodies off of Murray, get him space separation early in their actions. I think that's a huge key. Uh, so in the, in the Phoenix series, this was mentioned by a bunch of people, you know, I think we all know how good a defensive player Jay McDaniels is screen navigation in particular. He was excellent in that series it, with the way that Denver runs these actions. Is that something that y you sort of think, is there anything that they do that would sort of negate his ability to do that in your feeling? Or is this kind of like, this is just, a different I don't, piece? I don't necessarily, I'm not suggesting by the way that they're going to automatically switch. Yeah. Right. If they, if they screen on the ball with a different defender to get to Jokic to then get to Jokic or, off the ball screen with a different, you know, he'll, he'll pass the ball, cut down the middle of the lane, then get a pin down, come back up towards the top, go into his left hand with a dribble handoff. Right. So I, I think Jade McDaniel's screen navigation, the kill Alexander Walker screen navigation, all of that stuff is super important for the wolves. Cause I, I don't expect them to just concede the switch. Right. Yeah. I would expect those guys to be hungry, to be on the ball with Jamal Murray, uh, Jamal Murray, huge key, uh, hit, two incredibly <laughs> difficult and big shots, two game winners in that series overall didn't shoot the ball particularly well. So I think his offensive production is a huge key. Um, Michael Porter jr. Has been playing exceptional yeah. uh, since the all-star break that carried over into round one real quick. His numbers post all-star break in the regular season, 18, a game, 51% from the field, 40% from three. That was a little bit of an uptick. He averaged about 16, 15.9, pre all-star break and a shade under 30, uh, 40% from three in that first round series, insane numbers, almost 23 points a game, eight rebounds a game, 55% from the field, 48% from three. So I'm looking and thinking about matchups and obviously some of this stuff they did during the regular season, you would expect Jaden McDaniels to be on Murray to start. Uh, I would assume Anthony Edwards is going to be on Michael Porter jr. And I would assume Mike Conley is going to be on KCP. That's, I think my expectation of how they match up to start Denver, they average 40% of rebounding their own misses against the Lakers. Um, as, as we sort of look at this, at this, this different matchup from a rebounding perspective, uh, what do you feel like Minnesota has to do differently to not let them just cook there? I think this is, this is to me a little bit of the chess match is how do you get Gobert away from the basket? particularly if like I expect them to do and like they've done in the past, particularly if they're cross matched, right? The one shot the teams have shown they're very comfortable allowing is an Aaron Gordon three pointer. So just spacing him out to the corner to shoot a three and, and that I don't necessarily think that's going to get him away from the basket. So m maybe there's more involvement with Aaron Gordon uh, setting screens on the ball, setting screens off the ball, just anything to keep Gobert involved so he's just not back there in center field to rebound the basketball, contest at the rim, clog up the paint, all that stuff. That that to me is how do we get how do we move Gobert around yeah. when he's cross matched on Gordon? That's an important part of this. Um, the other thing, I just want to go through these games real quick because if my uh, if my not my math, but if my uh, if my sort of uh, Quick research this morning holds true. Uh, they played the fourth game of the season. Minnesota handed Denver their first loss. I believe that was the only game where everyone important played. Um, Murray was five for 16. Porter was two for 11. Uh, then they played three times between March 19th and April 10th. March 19th, if you remember that game, uh, no Gobert, 
no cat. Kyle Anderson guarded Jokic. Uh, he went for 35. Michael Porter had a big, big second half. Uh, Nuggets ended up winning by three. Then they play again on March 29th. Minnesota wins that game. No Carl Anthony Towns. Uh, that was when he was still coming back from his injury. Uh, no Jamal Murray in that game. Then Denver won uh, April 10th. Carl Anthony Towns did not play. Uh, Jokic goes for 41, 11, and 7 on 16 of 20 shooting. The other thing I found was interesting. Jokic, uh, four games against the Wolves this year, and it was the least amount of assists per game against any opponent in the NBA. He only averaged 4.3 assists per game. So again, a lot of his assists, particularly in the half court, are off those cuts, right? Gobert is back there. That's part of it, right? Part of the cross-matching thing is we're going to keep Gobert there. Jokic then can operate as a scorer against a Carl Anthony Towns or against a Nas Reed or against a Kyle, Kyle Anderson. They're, they're in some ways forcing his hand. So how he gets everyone else involved in this series beyond just the two-man action with you know Jamal Murray – I think is a, is a big key. So all of those delay cuts, the back screens, the movement stuff they run with him at the elbow or the high post, figuring out ways to score out of that, I think is going to be a huge key as well. Do you think, do you think we're going to see a lot of uh, Gordon on Ant? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. That's uh, I think they have, they have some options with how they match up. Um, you know, I, if they do opt to do that, uh, you would expect, uh, you know, Porter Jr. or KCP to kind of be on cat? Do they try to punish that matchup? Uh, that's that's important. I, I think overall, Denver's been a great defensive team, right? So the other point is the Anthony Edwards pick and roll. Uh, Ant had a phenomenal series last year. He had a phenomenal, uh, in uh, in round one against the Nuggets, he had a phenomenal series this year in round one against Phoenix. Um so one of the things I was thinking about this morning is just Jokic liking to be up, particularly against a guy like Anthony Edwards, uh, how and where they set high ball screens so that Edwards, like Dame does, can sort of attack in space and try to get around Jokic. And then if he is up, Gobert making plays out of the short roll, how Denver rotates around that, super important as well. And look, they're going to play game one on Saturday. Yeah. We're going to get some data. We're going to get some info. Yeah. And this thing may change. I may be way off on all this. Uh, I'm not even predicting anything. I'm just, I'm just giving my thoughts. This has been our DraftKings Sportsbook segment. Happy Threes Day. You can earn a bigger bonus bet with every three made in an NBA game when you place a pregame first three-pointer bet on any Tuesday or Thursday game of your choice. Just opt in, place a qualifying bet, and for every three that's hit, you stand to score a bigger bonus bet. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code JJ when you place an NBA pregame first three-pointer bet on any game of your choice today. That's code JJ only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. See dkng.co slash bball for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. One token per customer. Pre-game first three-point bet required to earn credit for reward for each three-pointer scored in the game. Minimum bet and max reward varies. Tokens expire at the start of the final NBA game each day when offered. Reward issued as one bonus bet that expires 168 hours after issuance. Let's get to our conversation with... One of the goats, a legend, uh, Shaquille O'Neal. We were talking on your podcast about how you are a little bit of a hater of today's players. Some of that was in jest. I do want to get into one thing on that in a second, but there's a couple guys I think that you've been pretty consistent calling out. One is Dwight. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just curious, like, why? Why, why Dwight? Like what? And what's your definition of calling out? I just feel like th there are certain times where uh, it'll be like out of the blue and you'll, you'll call him out. It's like Ben Simmons is the other guy that I think you've done a couple of times. And I, I don't, I'm not saying you don't have the right to call people out. 
I, I just feel like even going back to when I played with Dwight, it feels like there's this like, uh, it's not, rivalry is not the right word. And I know I got to be careful about the words I use in front of you. Yes, you do. <laughs> how, how long have you known me? Uh, I met you in, I met you in 2006. Yeah. I've always been a nice guy to you. Been a great guy to me. So would you say I'm a nice guy? Yeah. Would you say I'm playing most of the times when I say certain things? Uh, yeah. And would you think that if you're not sensitive, you can't handle it? Okay. There's your answer. You got to understand about me. When I'm serious, the world won't know. It'll just be me and you. Oh, interesting. You see what I'm saying? I, I have to like you to be able to say something about you. And I actually like the way. I am the current president of the Big Man Alliance. I like all big men who have the opportunity to overthrow me. And sometimes I will add fuel to the fire to see what type of people they are. And if I say something and you respond and you respond sensitively, that shows me you don't have it. Okay. And a lot of times I just be playing. So am I serious when I talk about these guys? No, it's fun. I'm a fun guy. Yeah. Because again, when it's serious, you'll know it's serious because it'll be something else added to that article. So, and then, and then when I do call these guys out, I try to keep it as factual as possible. Like when I was critiquing Ben Simmons, and I, I throw this word out a lot, and you have this badge, it's a G14 classification badge. For example, if, if I'm trying to shoot a jumper and I'm scoring a lot of points, but my form is, is not like it should be, you have G14 classification as a shooter to say, Shaq, tuck your elbow in, follow through, leave it up. So I think I, when it comes to being a big guy or NBA player or great, I have G14 classic, classification to say certain things. A lot of times if I am, am getting personal, my panel will say, you're getting a little too personal. So I just try to keep it a lot of factual. So it all started with the way when I said, in his average 28-10. You want to be dominant, you want to call yourself Superman. I know this for a fact. 28-10, when you get to the playoffs, add five to your PPG. And that's how you become a dominant big man. So a lot of times when I say some people get sensitive, and if you get sensitive, it's, it's not really my problem, but it's never nothing personal with me. This you, you brought up the G14 classification, which I've heard you talk about before, and I've always found it very fascinating. So, something came up recently where uh, Perk said something about you guys not watching games, and, and you guys had a, a whole response to it. But the the the, the part that, kind of stood out to me and I wanted to like ask you about this because I, I like I'm genuinely curious about this because I am not a Hall of Famer I'm not a Hall of Fame basketball player I was never an all-star I was never an all-NBA guy um and it I don't know wh whether it was you or Charles but you were like you know he's talking about two Hall of Famers right I, I I'm just curious like when you are in that seat not even just at TNT but when you are in that seat of being a Hall of Famer of being an all-time great like, what is your tolerance level for people critiquing you? I think, well, as a player, I think a lot of players get mad at a lot of people. You talk up here, but you play down here. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like when Charles talks about championships, I, I ask him, how do you know? How do you know? Yeah. What you you went to one two, how do you know? So when certain people talk, you know, when, when like like you you talk about, ah, 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 but you didn't apply it to your game. So are you believable? And that's why some guys get mad when certain people say things. So when I say G fourteen classification, I know what it's like Joel and B to get double team. I know what it's like uh, Victor Wimbanyama to be the number one pick and have it. Like I know I can I can talk about this. Other guys that that, that don't have that experience, you can't talk. About. You know what it's like to be a great shooter. Yeah. You know what it's like down by one. You got to hit that shot. You know what it's like coming off that screen full speed. You were regimented. Y'all know what it's like. So I think people have problems with us is when they look at you and say, "Okay, you you, you were there, but you're talking like you're here." Mm -hmm. See, I can talk like I hear. Mm -hmm. You can talk like you're there. Your partner, LeBron, can talk like, but certain people. So it's not about critiquing. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, you, you, you're under me. So for you to say, Sid, I don't watch games because we have different critiques. And, and this is based off of, 
he likes the Knicks, and I don't like the Knicks. So when you say something, and again, I ain't sensitive. I'm going to say something back. I'm coming out with a mixtape. I don't, I don't get sensitive and whine and do all that. You say something like it, but again, it ain't nothing personal. Like, I don't, I'm 50 years old. I ain't trying to do all that. But you say something, I'm going to say something. And it's all part of the ecosystem of this thing we call marketing. It's all fun and games. But again, I think regular people get upset when, when they hear people, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And I'm like, like, if I can question, do you, how do you know? Do you view me, me as a regular person? Because, I, I mean, in, the, no, in, the, in terms have, of the NBA history, I'm a very regular player. No, but you have G14 classification in certain areas. You are, you are one of the best shooters in NBA history. So you can talk about shooting. You can even talk about playing. You can even talk about certain pressures of being a shooter. I respect you for that. But once you start talking about dominant big man and big, I'm gonna be like, ah, <laughs> dude, ah. I gave you all the love possible on your I'm, podcast. I, you did, but I'm, I'm just saying. So like, if I and then you know, even with me, like I don't, you don't hear me talking about people's free throws, <laughs> right? You just don't, and you will never. Like that's, uh, I don't have like I, I can't I can't say oh tuck it, bend your knee. No, shut the hell up. So. I mean, but I want to. I want to ask you about the free throws. I do have a. I do have a question about because you you referenced the thing with uh with Chuck and the championships or whatever, and and I I came in the NBA in, in 2006 and played in the finals in 09. That was uh Kobe. Kobe won that year with Powell. They won again the next year. Y'all lost um, in the finals. What? Y'all lost in the finals. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, Orlando's never won a championship. Oh, and two in the finals. You know about that? <laughs> yeah, I do know about that. <laughs> At, at least, least, you got, won at least a we game. got a game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> at least we yeah, got a game. Exactly. I um, said it first, so you couldn't say it. <laughs> but and, and now that now that I've like lived in this in this media world, I'm uh, you know I lived through it as a player, it's particularly with some of my peers. Chris Paul comes to mind. Like the whole discourse and conversation about rings and championships and and the culture around that. Um, did that exist in the '90s when you yes, played? Yes, it did. Did you feel the pressure of that? Particularly, yes, I, I would yes, assume, particularly when you went to LA. I did. And me and Kareem talked about this. So the stuff I'm doing to Dwight, they did to me. Thought it was a, I thought it was like a right of place. Thing. No, Kareem and Wilt. Oh wow! I'm in a restaurant one time. Wilt's right there. He didn't say nothing to me. So when I first got to LA, I was putting up big numbers, but we were getting swept. So they asked Kareem, said, "Man, Shaq's, you'll be a Laker great, boom, boom, boom." And Kareem stops the guy and says, "Is he really that great? They get swept all the time, and they haven't won a championship." Now, I want to go off, but that's Cap. He has G14 classification. So I got to suck it up and take it like a man. And say, but, but me being the type of person I am, I'm going to make you shut up, Kareem. Can't say nothing to you now because you're absolutely correct. Yeah, Shaq's putting up good numbers, but if his team got swept six times, is he really a great player? I got to eat that. So now I got to, now I got to turn up. And then, you know, you win one. Oh, bitch can't win another one. Then you win two. Oh, you know, you know, the other Lakers didn't three people. And then, and then you win another one. And then you start to get the respect. But, you know, so the stuff that I'm doing is the stuff that was done to me. But if you're the right type of person with the right type of mentality, it should be used as motivation. Yeah. Because that's how I see it. Well, yeah, you were telling me that the motivation particularly early in your career, was was uh, paying attention to what made other players great. I think what, what was interesting as a, as a kid and a teenager um, in your prime, Orlando, through the Lakers, and, and then as a college kid watching you in Miami, is um, you always played with a level of joy. Like there was this perfect balance of joy and a disposition. There's not a lot of people that can find that balance of of joy and then the disposition to dominate. Like I, the best example I can come up with, truthfully, is Luca. Like Luca, because I was his teammate for a couple months and I saw it, I, li- I witnessed it. It's like there's a playfulness to it, but there's still a killer mentality, and it feels unnatural to me, but it feels very natural to you. The 82-game preseason is in the books, and it's finally time for the real season. Don't miss out on any of the NBA playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. From the play-in tournament through the finals, DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same-game parlays, live betting odds boosts, and so much more. 
certainly got my eyes on game one of the Timberwolves and Nuggets. Nuggets favored right now in that game. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code JJ. New customers bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's code JJ only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash bball for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. That that came from two places. The first place has always been told you're never going to make it. You know, we talked about on my podcast how I, I, I wasn't a dunker until my junior year at 6'11". You're clumsy. You're never going to make it. If you're not dunking now, you're not going to even get drafted. So I've always had that button. What the fuck you say? I've always had that what the fuck you say to me button. Right? So now that I'm a dunker, right, and boom, boom, then you go to college. Up. Oh. You're not playing against six two guys no more. Now you got to go up against Stanley Roberts and there's Chris Jackson there, and I wasn't getting no props. You might not get drafted. What the fuck you say to me? Number one pick. Now when I get to the NBA, there's a whole bunch of people there, All right? Oh, you're not going to do this. Or, oh, you're playing in a small market. No more than that. So I've always had that button. Now the entertainment side is, and like I always tell a story. And my father's been gone for a long time, but he's molded me into the, the, the guy that I am. And he used to do a lot of karate kid sort of thing. So growing up in San Antonio, my junior, senior year, he calls his friend Mingo, borrows some money. He wants me to see John Conkak play. Because John Conkak just signed that 15 for three. And I'm 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 junior going to my senior year, ain't got no offers. So right now, I'm fucking joining the Army. But there's still hope. Just... Watch this guy that's making fifteen million. So we go to the game and it's a fucking terrible game. He's fucking pissed because now he got to pay the money back. So he hits me in the chest. Boom! If you ever make it to this level and pe- all these people paying this money to watch y'all play, make sure you put on a show. So I've always said I have to put on a show because I know I was making a lot of money because of John Conkac and all Magic. of that came from that one moment. Yeah, from that one moment. Because like we went to the game, and it was a fucking terrible game. It even made me say, "Why the fuck is this guy making?" 15 million. No disrespect to John, but I'm like, well, like it, it was it was just pick and roll, pop, shoot. I was like, it ain't the crowd's not going crazy. Like nothing's happening here. So I always said, like, if I if I get the chance, and then the first thing I, I did was I started something at LSU called the Shack Pack. So me and my boy, we go get these little shirts, and I pin out 150 shirts and. I actually got it from watching Duke play. You know, the little section I had came up crazy. So I fucking printed these cheap shirts that said Shaq back, and I gave them to 20 guys. I was like, every time I do something, fucking y'all go crazy. And I would give them tickets to the game. I said, every time I do any fucking thing, y'all just go crazy. So it was sort of like, you know, trying to to help bring, like, the entertainment aspect of the game. That's really interesting. One of my favorite dunks in NBA history is uh, your dunk on Chris Dudley. Um I find it to be incredibly disrespectful. <laughs> like you know why? You know why I did that? Because I found it disrespectful that they didn't double me. <laughs> it's like if you look, I look back first, and I'm like, "Oh, you really? One dribble? Oh shit! Two dribble, three dribble, drop step, and then he's still trying to play strong." And I was like, and then I think he was playing for Pat Riley at the time. I just hated that that yeah. whole. That whole, oh, we're going to intimidate you with the, bro, I used to get beat up every day. My fucking cousin, Ken Dog, Brian, Googie, I used to play against old men in the gym and my father. I used to get fucked as so hell. That little shit y'all was doing is not even 1% of the ass whoopings that I was taking growing up and being disciplined. So, like, when you don't double me, I take it as a sign of disrespect. <laughs> I was not going to go that way way with the question but, but that's what I'm just saying <laughs> but, you gotta fucking double me or else Philly that one year in the finals yeah the Kimbe oh I'm the defensive player of the year really okay yeah. alright we about to see what I, I an observation and correct me if I'm wrong an observation and I'm floating it out there um 
I, 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 get, I get the sense that you, particularly as a, as a basketball player, you were looking for slights as motivation. Is that yes. accurate? Yes, that's very accurate. Okay. And the matter I get. Even within a game. Yes, and the matter I got, the more dominant I played. Yeah. You know, a good thing about my family, my organization, they always tell me. Like this this guy right here, we grew up there. That's my little cousin, Connie. So I brought him to Orlando with me. So we were doing our thing. And, and like, if you're not a great player, I don't get motivated for it. It ain't nothing. I just, I can't. So I, I used to get killed by big country. I don't know why. So one time we playing him and he fucking killing me. And now I look at him in the stands and he in front of everybody. What the fuck you doing? This motherfucker's killing you. So now he embraced me. Now I'm mad. Now I can play. So I've always had, you know, people like that around me. But, yeah, I need little things to, to get me going, whether it's an article that somebody said or something did earlier. You, did you seek it out? Yeah. Or did you I hope did. that your your people around you would, would tell you things? I, both. I would, I, would, I would watch ESPN. You would have fucking – dude, I cannot imagine you in today's NBA. Like, oh, this is, this is Shaq in yeah, the locker room yeah, before a game. Yeah. Just scrolling Twitter. Yes. Looking for look, comments. Looking for shit. <laughs> and you know what's crazy? Every day, get home from – I'm going to Google – Shaquille no. O'Neal, and I'm going to read every article about me. Like, is that, is that, would, would you have done that? So hold on. Pro, the answer is yes and no. So in Orlando, when I first got to LA, if I lose a game, I tear my house up. I had to stop when I started having children, and which actually helped me because I'd be fucking mad all the fuck ah, all the time. Like, I just come on, especially, especially if we lose by one and I miss fucking 10 free throws and I shot the night before and my shit looked like your shit. Like, like in the gym, I'm you in the gym at home. But in the game, I, I don't know what the fuck happened. So I would fucking go crazy. Windows, furniture, TVs. But my first child, which was a little girl, I had, I had like, as soon as I walk in the door, I had to turn it off. And it actually helped me because it brought me away from the game. But before that, it was always the game, the game, the game, the game, the game. Fuck you. Shut the fuck up. And then, like you said, you, you had dickhead behavior. I had shithead behavior. Yeah. I was a shithead to everybody. Did any of that carry over in your retirement from the NBA, looking for slights? Yes and no. Okay. So when I, I that. so when I retired, and I hate using the D word because I know there's a lot of people that are very depressed. So let's just say very sad. Okay. Because my plan was to when I go to Boston was, and there was only one thing I got to pass up Will Chamberlain, and I had it all thing. I need to average nine, ten points. I could do that. I was doing that anyway because I wasn't the Shaq at Boston. So I got hurt after year one. Because my plan was that after I pass up Wilt Chamberlain, I was going to have a press conference and arrogantly say, I don't ever want to hear nobody else's fucking name. I'm the most dominant big man ever. But now you can say, Will, he has more points. I have more championships. It's subjective. I'm fine with that. But if I would have passed him up in points, wasn't going to be no debate. So I wanted to do that. So anyway... Got hurt, had a year left. I didn't plan that far. I wanted to do the Shaq farewell tour. I didn't plan that far. So I'm at the house just sitting. I was doing shit I never done before, like going out, talking to neighbors and shit. Tom, how are you? Like, fuck, I would go out of my house coat and my slippers and just be trying to talk to people. So I wasn't doing anything. And then I did the uh, retirement ceremony in my house and TNT was there. And Like, I, I wasn't planning on you know, doing NBA commentating. I just, I just didn't have a plan, so... For those two, three months, I was just sitting in the house like, and then there was nobody in there but me, 100,000 square foot house. It was just me, and like the chef would come, I'd just be like, go home. And I was just sitting there, and I was starting to get fat like Kendrick and Chuck, and I was just sitting there looking all all crazy, and and then TNT came and kind of, you know, restarted. And, you know, once I once I plugged it in and I could start it, you know, I got more energy, you know, to, to uh, start it doing other things. It's interesting to hear you talk about that time period um, because of everything else you had done, right? You, you and I wasn't even going to bring this up, but it just, it it strikes me. You had been in movies. You had massive amount of commercials massive amount of investments uh obviously your 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 rap albums um so you had all this other stuff and yet there was still a period i would call it i talked about this the other day on Le dan levitard show 
there's like a, I don't want to be dramatic. You, you use the D word. I don't want to use the other D word, which is death. But when you retire as an athlete, there's a grieving period. It is. And it doesn't matter what you were able to accomplish because you accomplished more than fucking 99.9% of NBA players. There's, there still exists that grieving period. What, what, for you, have you reflected at all on that grieving period? Like what yeah, it was, was it that you, that you sort of were sad about? Not being him. But you didn't feel like you were him? No. Him, him is 28, 10. Fucking average nine points in Boston. I felt like I was robbing the people. I felt so bad that when they called me back and said, hey, man, we owe you 1.5, I said, fucking keep it. Keep it. I'm, I'm not coming up to the average six points. And, no. So that that part was. And then and then when you read it, like, I'm the type when I read it, I see if there's some truth in the criticism. Shaq's not the Shaq anymore. I have to accept it. Like, when you start fucking doing this to get a fucking dunk, it's gone. <laughs> and, and the crazy thing is I was dominant for so long, I never even thought about the, hey, one day it's going to be gone process, and that shit was starting to go. So that was, I'm not him anymore. That, 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 that right there killed me. And then I'm not playing anymore. Like, it first hit me when I didn't make the All-Star team. I had to act like, oh, I'm on the player, but I'm like, bro, I, I dominated the All-Star game for 12, 13 years in a row. Now I don't even get no fucking votes. So that part kind of kind of messed me up. And then being injured and not playing and not having anything to do, like all, all that other stuff was cool, but you have to understand I'm programmed to do more. Like once I do something and I accomplish it, I forget about it. That's why I like talking to old players. They tell me shit I don't remember. Like once I do something, it's over with. I got to do something else. You got to do the next thing. I got to do the next thing. And I don't, you know, I don't, you know, reflect on my laurels and, oh, I did this and I did that. That shit don't matter because it ain't, it ain't what you've done. It's what are you doing now? So I'm just, and then that keeps me young. That keeps me young. I have a new appreciation for age. Uh, you know who Dion Cole is? Dion Cole? Yeah. He's a comedian. Okay. LeBron knows him. So he did a special one day. Why do you say LeBron knows him? Like, why, why is that important? Because he's a comedian. Uh, no, why do you, uh, like, why, like, you could have said anybody knew, knew who Dion Cole was. Why LeBron? I'm just saying because he's a black comedian, and I know LeBron watches black. You probably don't watch black comedy, which is cool. I watch white comedy, though. You know, I used to watch all all types yeah. of shit. I Unfortunately, guess. all I do now is watch the fucking NBA. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I watched anyway. a TV show in, like, three years. <laughs> so anyway, he, he, had a, <laughs> he had a special, and he was like, where all the 40-year-olders at? <sighs> and Dion's our age, my age. He said, where the 50-year-olders at? <sighs> then he says, 20 summers left. And that fucked me up. You know what that means? Mm -hmm. In 20 summers, I'm going to be fucking 70. So I got a new appreciation for life. I'm doing every fucking thing I can and having fun and not giving a fuck about anything or anyone and just be respectful about it. And then, because I'm 52, so I got 18 summers left, so... I'm glad he did that because it gave me a new perspective. Because I'm still doing young people shit. We, me, me, me and my cousin the other day, we saw a shopping cart and we, it's like when we were little, we used to take the shopping carts and fucking roll down hills. So I told him, I said, hey, let's get this fucking shopping cart and roll down here. Man, fuck you, I ain't doing it. Like he's he's younger than me, but he's like, man, I'm not doing that shit. I'm 40 years old. I want to be young. You know what I'm gonna do this summer? I'm gonna go to a fucking water park. I am. I'm gonna slide down the fucking slide. I am. I'm going to fucking skydive. I am. I'm going to do it. You want to do it with me, skydiving? Me, you, and LeBron? <laughs> if y'all fucking do it, listen. I'll do it. All right, this is a bit now. This no, is a bit. The it, LeBron thing's a bit. It's a bit. <laughs> that's your partner. See, see, you don't even, see, you look at me as a hater. You don't understand what I'm doing. I'm fucking marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. I actually have a. I have a. No, no, don't, don't go over no. If you and LeBron go skydiving, I'll do it. I was gonna say, I, I legit have like a, a weird desire to skydive. If you and LeBron go skydiving, I'll do it. All right. Bro, I, by the way, I. Are you I gonna went, do it? Yeah, for right, sure. Deal. Yeah, yeah. Deal. I'm sure LeBron and the Lakers would fucking just <laughs> <laughs> really jump on board with that, dude. I I took my kids to Disney World in February. You talk about like uh, a, a, an experience that makes you appreciate life. It was like the most fun I've had in years. Did you do? Did, did you do it the regular way or the VIP way? I did the VIP way, man. You I cheater. didn't make your type of money, but I made enough. Cheater. Money to... I did it the regular way. Fuck out of here! You I, did it the regular way. We stood in line. 
in the back of the line. <laughs> First time I did a regular way, and then after that, I, I, I did the, you know, the VIP way. When I it played there, fun. I took my niece there. She was probably like four or five at the time. I played in Orlando, and I did it the regular way. And um, and I was just like, I'm not doing that again. Is it, it's, it, I like efficiency with my time. Right. I like efficiency with my time. Um, I just want to make one comment to you because I and I really appreciate you you saying what you said about not being him. Um, for all of us that have participated at the highest level and played in the NBA, we all have to face that moment. Uh, that was also very difficult for me, and and I, I didn't realize it until the moment came. I always was like, yeah, you know what? I, I can be, I can be, uh, no offense to him, but I, I, I'll, I'll do the Udonis Haslam thing. I'll be on a roster and, and be a leader and, and be a good vet, and, you know, look after the young guys, help the coaching staff with the interpersonal stuff. Like I was convinced that was, I was, I could do that. When I got to the end and I couldn't be myself on the court, when I lost whatever juice I had personally and I couldn't be myself, I was like, I, I it was dark, man. It was. it was depressing. And I and I always say that I've I've told I've told this to people and I've talked about this before, but I fucking cannot imagine what it's like to be him and then have to go through that. It's difficult. It is. Um, you brought up the free throws, and I want to make a comment too about because I play with De- DeAndre, I played with Dwight. Um, you know, the the whole hack a shack thing. You know, there was the hack of Dwight. There was the hack, hack of DJ thing. Like, I, I lived through that. I think Dwight shot like 39 free throws one game in Golden State when I played yeah. with him. People would always make the comment, uh, you know, wh- why aren't they working on their free throws? And I was around these guys. I was around DJ for four years, around Shaq, or, uh, Dwight for six. Like, I, they're in the gym every single day working on their free throws. Was that a burden for you as a player? I wouldn't say it was a burden because it would piss me off because, like I said, when I'm in my house shooting, I look like you. And everybody would be mad that when I get in the game, it wouldn't convert. It wouldn't convert. I don't know if it was a concentration thing. i say it was a humbling experience from the man upstairs. Imagine if I played how I played and shot like you and Steph. What type of person do you think I'd be? Just think about that. So, but I had something that a lot of players don't have. When I needed to hit that motherfucker, I'm going to hit it every time. When I'm looking at people and they're depending on me, I'm going to hit that one every time. Like, that's why, like I, I told Charles and them, I said, percentages don't matter if you don't hit the ones you're supposed to hit. See, a lot of guys, 70, 80% miss the one that they're supposed to hit. When I needed to hit them in the finals, not regular, when I needed to hit them in the finals, I'm gonna always hit them, but I don't. I don't make excuses. I did practice. I practice. I I practice on that more than I practice on my moves. You ever heard of Buzzy Brayman? Buzzy Brayman? Yes, the I shot know. doctor. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, anyway, he was in Orlando. I work at every shot doctor, and I'd watch everybody and D Scott and Glenn Rice and the L and this. And again, when I'm at the crib, my shit was butter. But when I got in the game, sometimes. Did you, did you ever uh, see a sports psychologist for that? No, I don't need sports psychologists. But I'm about to become a sports psychologist. I'm uh, enrolling in school in the fall. How many how many degrees do you have at this point? Uh, four. Four. This yes. will be your fifth? Yes, it'll be my fifth. That's incredible. Bachelor's, master's, doctorate, street. Street. Yeah, I have a street degree. And then I'm going to get one. And uh, Where would you get the street degree from? From the streets. School of heart. Fuck you. <laughs> The fuck you think I'm from the suburbs? <laughs> yeah, young man. I'm just kidding with you. No, so, but I, I don't know. I Again, it's like one of the things I wish I had. Like, I, I think I pretty much had everything else, but I wish I could shoot. I wish I was a bona fide shooter. Like, I wish I had, like, the pretty form when I shot. It's just, you can't ever, ever have everything. And then that's what, that's what really makes me mad, like, points-wise. I know you're an analytical guy. I'm at 28, 28,000, right? I missed 250 games because of injury. At averaging 28, but let's just bring it down to 25. 
So now they're what, 5,000 points? So that'll put me at 33. Let's just say I bring my free throw percentage up a little bit. I'd be at 30, 34, 36,000 points. That's your fucking fault that you didn't get there. So, you know, all the criticism that I take from other people, guess what? I criticize myself. That's why That's why that shit don't bother me. I'm not sensitive. If there's some truth in the criticism, I'm fucking eat it, and I'm be mad. You never see me, uh, like, you're right, I wasn't a great free throw shooter, but I'm mad I miss. And then, like, you know, the, the games I missed wasn't my fault. Matt Geiger, broke a thumb, six to eight weeks. Big baby, boom. One time, Nick Van Exel threw me alive. I came down and bust my kneecap. So one time in the game, I was showing off, and I did the Merton Hanks. Blew my motherfucking abdomen muscles. I had to sit out fucking six weeks. You, you don't remember that game? Where I gave a dude an in and out dribble, and I laid it up, and it was in the life. with the Lakers? Yeah. And I, yeah. And I, you know who that is? Merton Hanks, right? Merton well, Hanks? Yeah, Merton Hanks played for the 49s. Like, every time he got an interception. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like that. So yeah, yeah. one day I did 36? a 36? Was it 30, yeah, number 36? Yeah. One of those numbers. Yeah. And I fucking did like that. Yeah. The next day, I blew up my stomach. So, yeah. you know, I missed 250 games. So that's another 5,000 points. That I know I definitely would have. So that would put me at 33. That would make me what? Number two, three, but now I'm number nine. KD just passed me and got up a couple of guys. I'm, I'm probably going to be out the top 10 in the next, next four or five years, which is really going to piss me off. So, oh, uh, I'm going to be so mad when that happens. I'm going to tear this fucking house up. I actually know what I'm going to do. I'm gonna go, I, I've got a couple acres out there. I'm going to take up axe and fucking tree, tree work. Yeah, I'm gonna chop down the tree. You um I'm staring at this wall right now. <laughs> uh which lists uh, uh some of your accomplishments. All of them. All of them. Yeah. Okay. Except high school. You're you're to me you're 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 goaded. No. No? I'm not. I get jealous that my name is not in that greatest of all times. But I come from the era of if it's not uh, dominantly for sure, don't mention my name. And of course, we have a lot of different categories. Uh, the most dominant category, I, I'm I'm him. You only can say one other name. I don't want to hear nobody else's name. That's why I wanted to pass him up in points. I was going to fucking arrogantly say, I don't want to hear his name. But, you know, the greatest of all time, I, I, I would like to be in that conversation. But if it's not definite, see, like when you talk about Brian and, and Mike is definite. And Kobe should be at it. It's definite. They're a great player. I, I want to be in that conversation. If I'm not in that conversation, I don't want no fucking considerations. Don't give me no consideration. So, right. But I am jealous that I'm not in that conversation. I would have liked. But when it comes to knowing the greatest big man I am in that conversation, that's definite. So, you know, we, we could talk about it like that. One of the greatest big men in Orlando Magic history, that's definite. We can have a little conversation. But if it's not definite, I don't want to hear it. What? One of the greatest big men in Orlando Magic history. It's you, Dwight Howard, and Greg Kite. Yeah. What you said earlier. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give it to you, man. I'll oh, it's it me? You. Yeah, I'll give I'm it I'm the you. best in Orlando Magic history? I'll give it to you. Yes. I'll give it to Even you. Even though I only played there four years? <laughs> it's fascinating to me that you said that you don't want to be considered for the discussion. No, I never said that. I said I'm jealous that I'm not considered. But I just said you are. No, no. Who in their right mind doesn't have you in the discussion? As well, one of the greatest players of all time? Shaq, you are. No. But I'm saying I come from the area if it's not definite. You see what I'm saying? Like I wanted to be, he's the greatest player with eyebrows up like this. Now nah, he was one. Now nah, I don't want to be one. I want to be that guy. I want to be him. That's why, that's why when it comes to most dominant, I'm him. Only one or two. Ain't nobody else. Orlando Magic History. I'm him. Like I want to be. I want to be the, the 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 fucking head honcho, the fucking top guy. If not, don't mention my name. That means I'm a regular person. Do you feel like there was a season or a version of yourself where you were at your peak or the most most dominant you ever were? When I first got my when I first got my first MVP, and the gentleman he's passed away, so I'm not going disrespect his name, but he, he voted against me, a gentleman here from Atlanta. So I got 99% of the vote. I would have been the first first ever unanimous MVP, but he voted for Iverson. So that 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 time right there, I, I was him. I was, I was the best player in the league. I was unstoppable. I was getting it done. Nothing worked. Double, triple team, hack and shack, it didn't work. And we was able to win the championship. Almost didn't win it. 
But, you know, and this is why when I talk, I talk about the others because they saved my ass in that game seven. Like, I didn't, I, I, I didn't wake up to the game seven to the fourth quarter. But we were down 15, and B. Shaw and Robert Ory and Rick Fox, they just kept playing. They kept looking at me like, come on, man, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And then finally they, they brought it close, and then Kobe did what he did, and I hit a couple shots at the end, and we were able to get over that hump. And then after being swept by the Houston Rockets in the finals, and it's part of my brain. If I ever get back to the finals again, I'm fucking dominating. I got to win. So that's why, you know, when you were talking about my finals numbers, because it was a fear that if I don't play like that, we're not going to win. And if we don't win, it'll be your fault. And then people will automatically say you're not a great player. And I can't have that. Fear, fear motivated me and propelled me to be great. Fear of what people say. You know, I talk about all the other people being sensitive. I know they're sensitive because I used to be sensitive. I know exactly what they're going through when they hear me talk shit, and I love it because I have to get them out of being sensitive. Just fucking joking, man. Relax. It ain't that serious, bro. I'm playing. You caught me. The jig's up. Like, if you think I care enough about you to be serious, you got another thing coming. Well, nah, I'm just playing. I want to make a point to the, the the your teammates. I don't know if you just used the word "saved" you or "bailed you out" or whatever in that in that game seven. Um, I, I I get annoyed. I get annoyed when we. Uh, it, it's part of the 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 goat discussion. It's part of the debate around this player, that player. I I, I get really annoyed with picking and choosing uh, moments in players' career. Um, because the reality is like, who took, who took the winning shot in game seven in 2016? Who hit the game winner? It was Kyrie, right? Right. It was Kyrie. Mm-hmm. Kyrie, Kyrie hit the game winner in 2016. Yeah. yeah. Are you talking about who hit the game winner? Who hit the game winner against the Phoenix Suns in 93? It was John Paxson, right? Right. Um, there's who hit the game winner last night in Denver for the, for, for the Nuggets. That was Jamal Murray, right? Jamal Murray. Like th- that is the sport of basketball. There are moments where it's your time. There are moments where your teammates step up. I used this analogy last year. You may hate this analogy, but I I like this analogy because we always talk about Batmans and Robins in the NBA, and we get so fixated on the 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 alpha and then the the secondary guy, right? We get fixated on these two guys, and we put all the dis- discourse and pressure on these guys. In the history of the league, it's not just about Batman and Robin. I said. Beginning of Batman Begins, the Wayne Manor's on fire, and Bruce Wayne goes in, and a fucking beam falls on his chest, and he can't get up, and it's on fire, and he's going to be trapped in this building. And who comes in to save the day? Alfred. Batman's great. He's awesome. But he needed Alfred, right? You need your Alfreds in this sport. And this is why I always promote the others. Because I always, you know, Uchak has four rings, but couldn't have did it without my guys. Definitely. I, I, I know I could have probably carried one, just me being dominant, dominant, dominant. But listen, Big Shot Bob, Rick Fox, B. Shaw, Derek Fisher, Glenn Rice, GP, White Chocolate, Udonis Haslam. Like those guys helped me be Superman. You know, they helped me get four championships. And that's why I always promote them. Because what you said was ex- exactly correct. And, you know, all those guys that, that hit those big shots to make us superstars, you know, give us our our glory, it's true. You know, they're they're they're, they're forgotten. Because if Paxson don't hit that shot, Mike don't have six. And Charles has one. I'm glad Paxson hit that shot. I would hate to fucking hit, see Charles in the ring. Oh, you, oh, you just gave me a headache. Oh. Hey, Paxson, thank you. Oh, I'm glad you hit that shot. Charles with a ring? Oh, my. Oh, you couldn't tell him nothing. And, 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 just, and just to be clear, you, you went through a list, a number of your teammates, and you, you didn't mention Kobe, and that's because Kobe's not an Alfred, right? He's not, Kobe's not an Alfred. Like, no. You were talking about the guys like me who were like the, the quote-unquote role players. And the, and the crazy thing about him is he, he I, I wanted him to be Alfred, but he, he didn't want it. He was like, nope. I'm Batman. Like, no, I'm Batman. I'm Batman. I'm Batman. I'm Batman. <laughs> and it worked to our advantage. Because when you got two guys that want to take over, that's 60 points right there. 
right? But I was the guy that said, okay, because like he he was you thirty, 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 thirty. I'm was seven, kick it out to Jay's day for a three. Kick it out. Second quarter. Seven. Kick it out to the big shot. You know what I'm saying? So I I was the guy that had to keep everybody else involved. And then we just we said that. And then the fourth quarter, because I wouldn't hit free throw. All right, you're Batman. Do what you do. And we had that. We had that. Like once we developed that understanding, unstoppable. With that, is is that in some ways? And it goes back to I think the the uh, the realization that you weren't him anymore. Learning to to sort of I don't want to say coexist, but learning to cede control at times in that relationship. Did that make it easier when you got to Miami with with D Wade? It was one word that kept us together. It's respect. For example, you've been talking shit to me at my house the whole time. You think I've been talking shit to you? I know you have. But guess what? But hold on. Let me finish. Let me finish. Can I finish? Look at me. Can I finish? You've been talking crazy to me in my house all the time. But guess what? We respect each other. So it'll never go overboard. See what I'm saying? Like, I said some things. You cut me off. I say some things. I cut you off. But the respect is there. So it can never go overboard. We used to fucking go at it. Motherfucker, I'm shooting. No, you shooting. But the respect is there. And I tell people all the time, you, you think you think we didn't get along. Go back right now. The first championship after we beat Indiana, it's a thousand motherfuckers on the floor. Who's the first person he fucking runs to? I didn't run to him. Who's the first person he ran to? The respect is always going to be there. As long as you have respect, you can go anywhere with a conversation. Friendly, curse, fuck you, da, da, da. Like, you've been talking crazy. My, you, that, that, that don't go down at my crib, JJ. I usually knock people out, but you my guy. <laughs> What is this? I'm, I'm just saying. What are you, these accusations? I'm, I'm just saying. Like, <laughs> what are these accusations? Like you, like be quiet. Hold on. What are you talking about? Like I, I wish we had a see, playback see? here. I wish we had a playback. You just here. cut me off again. See? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I so, motherfucker. I did your podcast. Yeah. This is my podcast. <laughs> but but I'm also truthful about the situation because now I'm like, bro. I just gave y'all three in a row. Y'all trade me. Am I an asshole? Is it me? All right, I'm going to fix that. Hello, Mr. D-Wade. You're in charge. You're Batman. I'm fucking Robin. I used to be Batman, so anything you want to know, I can teach you and tell you, but we're not going to even have these problems. It's you. So that's how I got rid of that. Because, again, I'm the guy, when I go to an organization, I don't give a fuck who there. I'm in charge. Like, for example, when I first got to Miami, wives could travel on a plane. No, the fuck they cannot. So they're not. I'm just, this shit's done with. No wife, no kids on the plane ever, unless we make it to the finals, and then they can come to games three, four, five, and six. All the wives hate me, but that's okay. You're not traveling. I'm in charge now. But when I got there, I was like, D-Wade, here you go, my guy. You're the guy. Because, cause again, like one thing about me, I'm realistic. I'm sensitive. I hear a lot of shit, talk a lot of shit. But, again, when I read some criticism, the first thing I do before I react, I see if there's some truth in it. So I'm like, yeah, I'm the most dominant big man in history. I gave you motherfuckers three out of four, and I'm the one to get traded. Am I an asshole? And you start to look, damn, maybe I shouldn't have talked to him like that. So now you start to question yourself, but then I still got some plan to do, so fuck all that. Don't worry about all that later. When we get to Miami, d way you're in charge, and I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. And that's why in the finals, when we, we went down 0-2, we had a respectful conversation. Hey, man, I'm getting fucking double dream. I'm going through a fucking divorce. I'm not playing good. What the fuck you going to do? Don't be looking for me. Motherfucker, go to work. And then he just turned it up, and that was how I was able to get number four because I was playing terrible. That, that, that's, and that's when I knew him was starting to die off. Because all that 20, 38 in the finals, not during that fucking Dallas series, but he... We had a respectful, hardcore conversation, and me, GP, and the Adonis, and we put him in a room like, yo, man, the fuck you going to do? And he just, because, listen, d is a great guy. He was like, fuck, not, not now. Go. Go to work. He just, and it just unleashed something. And that was, you know, part of, part of my plan. But I, my, I'm, I am a realistic him. Yeah. I think of this, uh, this moment. Right after I got drafted, I got I was able to 
play on like the U.S. national team roster. 06 to 08, they did a three-year commitment. It was 25 guys. They, they gave us two college kids. It was me and Adam Morrison got named to this roster. Oh, Adam Morrison. So I was hurt, and I, I go to the team meeting, and I'm kind of observing. You know, it's like Coach K's first meeting with the whole group. Like, it, it was just kind of like very observational. You could tell like D. Wade had just come off finals, right? It was – the room was was just – it was not awkward. It was just a feeling out thing. Get on the bus the next day for practice. And I'm kind of watching everybody get on the bus, and how guys are acting towards each other. Just, you know, these guys that compete against each other. And D-Way gets on the bus. And I just, like, noticed the, the vibe shift. And I'm like, this is two weeks after he's finals MVP. And I'm like, oh, right now? He is him, right? Like that to me. Hey, we talk MVPs. We can talk scoring titles. We can talk most dominant, all that bullshit. You lived it three times, I think. Finals MVP. Finals MVP. Like that, that to me is the ultimate. Am I off on that? Like I, I didn't live it. You no, lived it. Yeah, I, I want to yeah. know your opinion on that. Yeah, to, to me, it's the ultimate. And, I don't like doing things that hurt me twice. When I got swept in Orlando, it was embarrassing. And it was my fault. It was embarrassing. So I'm the type of guy that shit will live with me forever. Right? Because it was a mistake. A mistake that could have, like, I, you, you dickhead, you could have got Orlando the first championship. But you was fucking around, part. Because, like, people don't understand, like, when we beat Chicago, we had 10 days off. Yeah. So... I've heard this. You guys stayed in Orlando and partied, or you went elsewhere? Uh, we went. I I I went elsewhere. <laughs> Miami? No, Atlanta. Atlanta. Okay. I was just chilling because, like, I've learned that, like, the finals are ten days away. I can't be like this for ten days. So I'm gonna be like this for three days, and be like this for two days, and then around day six, now you got to fucking turn it off. Like ten days is too. Like I just. I have A D H D A D motherfucking D. Like it, it's impossible. So, you know, he gave us three days off and we came back to practice. But, you know, what it taught me is never celebrate until the job is done. When you beat the greatest guy in the world, and I don't care all that he took off and came back, I don't care. He was on the court. So we beat him. When you beat the greatest player in the world, we thought we had it. But Akeem just took it to a whole nother level that I I didn't even know he had. And we got swept. So now that's in my fucking head. And I'm like, if I ever get back to the finals, I'm going to fucking kill everybody. I don't care. So that's, I had to. And then, you know, we won the first one. And, you know, I'm still getting doubted. All right, if I get back to the finals, I'm going to do the same thing. But really, we got two. And now you're saying we can't do it again? Sacramento, Queens, yeah, Portland, okay. All right. So it was always in my head. Because, again, when you're sensitive like I am, you never want it to be your fault. And every time we lost a game or lost a playoff, so it was definitely my fault. And I took that responsibility. Like, all the times we got swept, is my fault. Especially when you shoot a terrible free throw percentage. You can't come to your best player in the fourth quarter. It's your fault. And I live with that all the time. And guess what? There's truth in that. So you really don't hear me really talk about it because it's the truth. And, and, and real recognizes real. I did not mean to interrupt you, just so we're clear. Yeah, I'm you not did. trying yeah, to be see, disrespectful. See, I thought you were done. See, <laughs> I thought see, you were done. See, I thought you were done. See, all, see, all this fucking pointing. <laughs> all this fucking it's pointing. acknowledgement, man. Uh, hey, but let's, you know, I like you, so we're, we're cool. Yeah, brother, hey. Hey, Shaq. I, what, what I always respect about you, you always play the game the right way. And I love guys that play the, the, the game the right way. You play with heart. I, I fucking hated you at Duke because I hated Duke. Yeah, of course. But in the league, you were, you were a consummate professional. You played the right way. I love shooters. So I've, I've, I've always had respect for you. So being that we're in this same fraternity, you can say whatever you want to say to me, bro. Because guess what? Just let me finish, see? You interrupt me again. Because the respect that I have for you, you've said some things. I know you have respect for me. So we're brothers. I don't know if you – do you have brothers? I have one brother, yeah. Do y'all fight a lot? As kids, yeah. That's the, So that's the point I'm trying to make. We're brothers. You can say whatever you want because I know you're not being disrespectful. Remember the key word. Like you, so, and that's what a lot of these 
players will understand when I'm critiquing them. I'm not being disrespectful. I'm actually giving you answers to the test. You got to average 28-10, buddy boy. You got to do this, buddy boy. Like, don't listen to how I say it. Listen to what I say. Like, I'm, I'm especially, especially big guys. I'm trying to give them the answers. And a lot of guys are, you know, sensitive, which is understandable. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something real quick. I was gonna say this in the intro, but I want to say it in front of you because you probably won't listen or watch this podcast, which is fine. Um, See? See? No. <laughs> I met you in 06. Yeah. Played against you, you know, for I think six more years. Um, you were always so good to me, and I always appreciated that. Seriously, I, I mean that. You were, except for one time. We used to run this play four out and it was just basically an empty side pick and roll in transition with our shooting four man so it was Rashard Lewis Ryan Anderson and it was 2010 Jason Williams brought the ball up white chocolate swung it and so at the time everybody would hedge with four men right so for me as the ball handler I could either drive away baseline or if I got middle and the four man didn't slip he set a good screen sometimes I could turn the corner and get in the paint so I turn the corner, get past the free throw line, and I, I'm thinking this shit's going to be sweet. And you're off. Like, you're, you're underneath the basket. So I'm like, I'm going into giant killer mode. And I go to shoot my floor, floater. I'm not saying you clothesline me, but you bowed the fuck out of me. And I landed super awkward. And my mom called me afterwards. She said, I'm so glad you do Pilates. That's why you didn't die there. <laughs> For real? <laughs> <laughs> well, hold on. This is leading to something. The reason I bring that up, because we were talking on your podcast about playing against our idols. And for me at the time, like playing against you, going up against Shaq, like it was a big deal. It was a big deal. And I, I told the story about Ray Allen. You mentioned Patrick earlier and uh, just what he meant, his influence. You, you and um, your dad talked about him when you were in high school and stuff. In that, you played in the golden age, I think of NBA centers, of dominant big men. Can you critique or break down what made each of those great players, because a lot of these guys are on the top 75 list of all time. What made them so fucking good and so difficult to match up night to night? Patrick Ewing. All the Georgetown boys. Fake left. Ah, hard as hell, but they're always going to go right. Running hook, one leg Dirk and whiskey style jumper, sometimes a sky hook, but they play with the ferocity. The New York Knicks taught me how to be tough. Oakley, Bonner, Starks, Xavier McDonald's, they would fuck you up, right? Then Detroit would do the same thing. So if you can handle that, you can make it. Because of my upbringing, because of the way I played to those guys, I, I knew I could. And then they were starting to fade out, and I knew I could use that same level of energy to take it to other guys. But Ewing, his ferocity, the way he played, the way he competed, and you could tell he wanted to be great. Kim Olajuwon, multiple moves on each block. Like, you know, when I talked about the Georgetown boys, fake 11 go right, that's mostly what they did. Akeem. Inside out, reverse pivot, pivot, you know, up and under. Kevin was kill style up and under. Shoot the jumper. Had a little bit of flair with his handle, could shoot the jump shot. Wasn't really that big and strong, so he would take you out and do certain things. And I think he had to learn that because when he first got to Houston, as you remember, he was the Twin Towers, and Ralph was the center, so which moved him to four. So he developed some four-man skills. David Robinson was a motherfucking track star. That motherfucker ran me out the gym the first time I played. I was like, it was early, and you know how I said I didn't work out? That motherfucker made me start working out immediately once I played this bird because he would just fly. <laughs> and I remember in, 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 uh, in high school watching him do the play where he spin off and did a lob, and that's what me and um, Brian Shaw, that's what we used to call the Shaw Shank Redemption. I got that from him. You got that from David Robinson. Got that from David Robinson. Because when, because when he was in Navy, like when little guys would try to bump him, he was like, I'm not, I'm not going to be fighting and wrestling with you guys. He would just spin off. So I got that from David Robinson. Uh, who am I missing? 
You said Alonzo. You yeah, said that George Yeah, Johnson yeah, Alonzo. Yeah, you know, Alonzo wanted my spot as the best new upcoming player, and Alonzo helped me maintain that edge because I remember when I first met met Alonzo in the in the elevator. Uh, we we got drafted at Important, and he was there with his boys. I was there with my boys, and he's like, "What are you looking at?" I was like, "The second pick," because I never faced him in college or anything. But you know, I, I I always knew because of what Dick Vitale said, he gonna be the number one pick. So like, he, so like even when I get in the draft, I'm like, I'm not sure if I'm being number one pick. But everybody kept saying he gonna be number one pick. So we're in the elevator. He with his crew, I'm with my crew. Said, Fuck you, looking at? I was like the number two pick. So I knew he was coming with that head, so I always had tried to stay above him. Uh, Rick Smits was fucking long. Use your length, you know, on a turnaround. Like, he, he wasn't rushing his turnaround. Like, when I first came, it was all jump, hook, and dunk, but Rick Smith used to take that little one, two, three bounce and shoot that turnaround. I was like, I got to add that shit to my game. David Robinson is running. I got to fucking run. Patrick Ewing is mean as shit, but we want Kim Olajuwon, a little flat. Like, I tried to add all that stuff. And it was hard for me to, like I said, it was hard for me to get up for the other guys. Like, Big Country used to kill me. I don't know what it was. I couldn't guard that motherfucker for nothing. Anything at all. He was just he just used to kill me. But I I, I used to look at all the, all the big guys and respect them and steal everything they had. Because you know why? I, I grew up watching karate movies. And... Student will always kill the master. And I was trying to kill everybody because I wanted that fucking spot. I'm a guy that's motivated by jealousy. Are you talking about fucking J.J. Reddick's jumper and you're not talking about mine? Let me tuck my shit. You see what I'm saying? So everything that somebody else had. I saw that develop. Yeah, you did? Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, last question for you. I, I do this uh, I do this segment. Um, uh, on our YouTube channel where I build around past NBA greats and I do it using, uh, some salary cap constraints. I basically take, take the top five, uh, payrolls. I average them out. I've got an all time great. The owner's willing to spend. Um, I build like an eight or nine man rotation. I built around you the last episode and I'm curious if you could pick, we'll just do a starting lineup. If you could pick four players to play in today's NBA for modern players. What do you think, which guys do you think would be a fit? And don't pick four max guys. Cause again, we got salary cap constraints. So how many, uh, so how many superstars going to have? Please say three. Just say three superstars, please. Three. And, and all right, including myself. Yes. Oh yeah. Including yourself for sure. And you know what I would do? I would actually sacrifice my salary for these guys. At the one, I got to go Steph Curry. At the two, I got to go Penny Hardaway. Because I know I'm going to get the fucking ball. At the three. Are they still playing? I'm, we're going current players. Oh, okay. I apologize. I apologize. Okay. So, <laughs> can I use three players? You need three players. You okay. got Steph and you in the starting lap. I need uh, three so more starters. Me and Steph. Oh, shit. This is tough. Steph at the one. Who I need at the two. I'm going Anthony Edwards at the two. And those are my three stars. Okay. Including me. So me, Steph, and Anthony Edwards. Who can I get? Can I get at the small forward? I'm going to go. Damn. Tatum's a star. I can't go with Tatum. Fuck. Power forward. Who can I get? All right, let's just go to power forward. Who can I get at power forward? I need a rebounder. Somebody can hit that shot. I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with Zubac. I like Zubac. Okay. He plays hard. I'm going to go with Zubac at the four. Right. Now I need a guy that's a superstar, but they're not treating him like a superstar. Number three has to be a shooter. Can't say Jalen Brown. He's a fucking star. Can't say Kevin Durant. Give me some help here. Trey Murphy. No. One of the, Trey Murphy? No. Uh... Jalen Williams. Brandon Ingram. Okay. Because I can get him also to play the max next contract. level. We're going to have to work out some right, salary He's a max? Yes, he's on a max contract. Right, well, we don't Not the super max. We can fit it in. We can fit it in. I like shit's it. hard. See, this is why I can't be no coach. That's, that's too hard. Who? Porzingis. Porter Jr. is also on a max. 
No. Nah. I'm telling you, this exercise is hard. It is. It really is hard. It really is hard. Um, is it true Luca's going to be making 80 million? Close to it, yeah. Fucking His jealous. Supermax so next summer will I'm be. I'm so jealous. I think they're projecting it like three, <sighs> between 370 and 400. Yeah. This is, we're going to end there. We're going to end there. Shaq, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you, my <laughs> guy. You know you made history. Appreciate What is that? Only guy come talk shit in my house and fucking get the leave. <laughs> Shaq was awesome. Let's get to the Old Man in the Three Draft presented by New Era with our friend Super. All right, let's welcome in OG friend of the show, Sue Bird. Up, Sue, good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, I, so I was recently on one of your Sue's Places mm-hmm. episodes where you <laughs> pretended to camp <laughs> with Coach K in Kville for the Carolina game. And upon the rewatch, I mean, I knew you had strong presence when I did the shoot with you, but yeah. on, on the rewatch, just your acting chops. Oh. Really really strong. Thanks. I, that actually, I felt the same way about you. So yeah. this feels like a strong compliment. I was like, Oh, we're doing this. We jumped right in. Yeah. yeah. What was your, what was your favorite part of the show? God, my favorite part. Um, man, there's some that I can't say, isn't that, I can tell you offline. One of my, my absolute favorite part was with coach K and I cannot say it publicly. Right. So I'll tell you later. Um, honestly, it's going to be a cheesy fave, but it was pretty cool, like bopping around all these places, like meeting some people who I knew well, but hadn't seen in a while. Some people I was meeting for the first time, like all of these legends in basketball. So it was pretty cool. Going to all these campuses, even though they're a pain to get to, um, was really fun. That's awesome. You had a good time. Yeah. Can I, can I reveal a secret about okay. our episode? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. The camping store we went to. <laughs> was about six blocks from my house in Brooklyn. It was not. It's a lot near, of trickery that happens on not, these shows. It was not JJ. near. TV is, <laughs> it was not near Duke's campus. Honestly, you want to know my, here's my favorite part. Um, the one we shot with Caitlin was this Logo 3 one. We had Jim Fredette come in. Actually, I want to say we were, we were thinking of, I think they were thinking of having you do that one. Yes, yeah, yeah, I got that. But then it was like yeah, too much yeah, Duke. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know how yeah, this goes. I yeah. feel it with UConn too. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so Jim Rufferett comes in. The whole, the premise, initial premise was Kate and I shooting around. I'm clanging them. I'm missing them. Oh, I'm retired. Let me bring in somebody else. But when we went to do it, I was like, you know how it is on your first day back after a while. I couldn't miss. Yeah. And they were like, well, that's, I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not missing now. Like there's no way. Yeah, so yeah, I just yeah. kept making them. I kept making them. So, you know, in front of Caitlin, it felt kind of good. Yeah. It sounds <laughs> familiar. It feels like you would have a similar. So like once you get in there, you're not missing on purpose. No. no dude, I, <laughs> Kylie and I went not. down to Miami to do a DraftKings commercial, uh, I don't know, a few months ago. I probably shot 60 free throws and I made 59 of them. <laughs> and and uh, I don't think, other than the miss, I don't think anything hit rim. Like it was all just cash. Shot was feeling good. Shoulder, God, it was loose. Ah, oh, it felt good. You know, if all only right. all the days were like the first days. <laughs> I know. This is what happens. <laughs> It's built into the DNA. Uh, all right. Before we begin the draft, we want to give a shout out to New Era, the official cap of the NBA, and now the official headwear of OM3. You can support your favorite team by wearing the same caps that the players do or show off your personal style with exclusive drops, shop headwear and apparel, and get 10% off when you go to neweracap.com and use code OLDMAN at checkout. That's 10% off your order using promo code OLDMAN. Some exclusions apply. And visit New Era Cap dot com slash om3 if you want to see our favorite caps tommy and i both wearing one i'm wearing a blank new era cap and tommy's wearing the logo of a pizza place this is a this is a cool cubs hat but oh is that a cubs hat? <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I wish this, I wish this was a pizza place and the jacket. <laughs> we're gonna have to we're gonna have to outfit you. We're gonna uh, have to send we're gonna have to send you, you guys a, like we're gonna have to send you that a box. scene in Wayne's world. <laughs> I'll never give in to the sponsors. <laughs> we're do we're doing it. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, Tommy. What is uh, Sue knows the rules, but what is the uh, what is the topic of today's? All right, we're draft. We are drafting best movie monologues. That's it. Okay. That's it. Um, Wait. Remind me the rules of the draft <laughs> order. That's all I need to. Know. You're picking first. Okay. You go first. Tommy second. I get two. Tommy. You get okay. two, okay. and yes. we snake it. And we snake it. Um, and for the purposes of this draft, a monologue we have decided is anything over one line of uh, dialogue. Yes. 
right? Yes. So yes. it can be a two liner or it could be a 27 liner. Okay. All right. So you're up. With the number one pick, I'm going to go a few good men. Colonel Jessup. You know what it is. Yeah. Son. Yeah. That's a, that's. We live in a world that has walls. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's Had a, to go number That's one. unimpeachable first pick. It's a good first pick. Shout out to uh, Jason Gallagher, who um, did a great mashup video on social uh, about one of my rants, and he did it to uh, the A Few Good Men monologue. So love that. Uh, all right, Tommy, number two. I'm going inches Al Pacino in a given Sunday in the conversation um, for – you know, great moments in a sports film. I think mm-hmm. for me, it's my favorite sp- speech in a film ever. Um, and I think it's timeless. I think, it, I think it fits in every sport. I think it fits in a lot of different parts of life. Taking it now because I knew it would be gone. So it's I need pick. to have it. It's, it's a good pick. pick. It's a good sports um, pick. We decided on this draft topic last night and I had a lot going on yesterday. So I didn't give it much thought. But when I woke up this morning and I thought to myself, I wonder what Tommy's going to pick. <laughs> I thought to myself... <laughs> <laughs> Al Pacino's speech. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. There you go. Um, all right. <clears throat> I can't believe uh, I ended up getting my top two on my board. Uh, number one pick, I'm going to go with uh, Liam Neeson's monologue from Taken oh, when he's on the phone. The skills. And I have a few of these that I'd like to just yeah. read through. <clears throat> Please. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you're looking for ransom, I can tell you I don't have money, but what I do have are a very particular set of skills, skills that I acquired over a very long career, skills that make a, make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you and I will kill you. Fuck. So good. So hard. <laughs> it's crazy. So guard. So good. It's crazy. Uh, second one, I got to get one comedic one in there, and that is uh, the debate um, moderator. From Billy Madison. Ooh, oh, I thought this of that. My, this is on my list. Wait, <laughs> we are so, now wait, all wait, so, dumber. <laughs> so is it is it the moderator that. or is it Billy? It's Billy. It's Billy. It's Billy's. Yeah, it's Mr. Billy's Mr. Madison, yeah. what you've said yeah. is one of the most insanely idiotic things I've ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having to listen having listened to it. I award you no points and may God have mercy on your soul. The reason I like that one, because I use that one a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great pick. Yeah. That was, pick. that was, uh, high on my board. Um, I'm going Alonzo speech at the end of training day. Okay. For my second pick. Yeah. yeah. King Kong. King Kong. Yep. yep. Playing basketball in Pelican Bay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Solid. Solid. I, needed, I needed a villain. Um, okay. I also tried to be, you know, hit, hit, hit a bunch of different categories. So this is my comedic play. I'm going to go Dr. Evil in Austin Powers. The details of my life are quite inconsequential. (laughs) (laughs) I like that poll. I would not, this would not have been on my list. That's a great poll. Uh, When it came out, I like memorized it. Um, First one, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Where he's like, he would womanize, he would drink. (laughs) He's talking about his dad. (laughs) It's like the best line. I love that. He would make outrageous claims. I love that movie. I forget. I was at a sleepover the first time I ever watched that with like four friends. We were in middle school and I think we watched it like three times and stayed until 6 a.m. God, I miss those days, man. I really did. What a time. Like that was a Friday night. (laughs) (laughs) That was a Friday (laughs) night. You're like, yes. Dude, we played Super like Nintendo. We, no, we like played could go back Nintendo and 64 and That'll watched be a su- Austin Powers. That's going to be a summer activity. My, bro- my, my kids and, and I do that. We have a bunk We have a bunk room in Sacramento. Oh, are you just like... And I, every like weekend, we'll just pick a night. We'll be like, all right, tonight's video game night. Can they watch uh, that but movie? But do you, do you yeah. show them the classics? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we show them classics. Yeah. You know what's interesting? Like little when little giants we, or something. Yeah, yeah. with Little Giants. Yeah. Uh, we have watched a bunch of movies that are like we grew up watching and thought were awesome Mm -hmm. that are rated PG. And then we watch them with our kids and there are some really problematic scenes in them because we, you know, they're, they're like a pretty content, like uh, starved outside of NBA stuff and uh, dumb YouTube videos. (laughs) Um, That's that movie. Austin Powers is like, that's, 
That's pretty age appropriate, right? I'm trying to think about what's in it. Absolutely not. I don't think so. I think it's like I'm like one of the first scenes is like the lasers come out. I think it's I think I think it's fine. Oh yeah. I think it's I mean we turned out okay. Yeah. Uh, All right. Uh, Maybe that's debatable. Okay. Um here is my sports play. Here we go. White men can't jump, Mm -hmm. but we're gonna go Gloria. Because sometimes when you win, you lose. Mm. And sometimes when you lose, you win. And sometimes when you win or lose, I forget now, you actually tie or some shit. All right. Interesting. I could have gone glass of water though, too. I was going to say, there's a thirst. few. Yeah. There's a few. I, I was torn. I went heavy sports in terms of- I like of, it. Solid. Yeah. I like okay. it. Mixing it up. Uh, I'm going gladiator. Mm. Are you not entertained? There's a few from this that probably were pickable, mm-hmm. but I feel like, especially if we're going in the, you don't need more than one or two lines. Solid. I needed to have Love it. Love that movie. Yeah, normally we save this for the fifth round, but that was really good value in the third round. Thank you. It's a good choice. God, I'm getting everything I need right now. This is so good. Same. Here comes Nolan. I know, I know. I'm just I'm waiting. waiting for inception. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for I don't know where. I don't know where it's coming from, but you know it's coming. <laughs> no, it's not. I just I what I realized <laughs> what I realized is that um my my choices here, and I'd only wrote down eight or nine of them, but my choices here are uh, unobjectively uh, some of the whitest movies <laughs> of all time. <laughs> so apologies for that. Apologies for that. Uh, I'm going to go with um, Robin Williams' monologue and Goodwill Hunting. Mm. Um, I mean, it's, it's long, so I'm not going to read it all. Give us the start. <sighs> So if I asked you about art, you'd probably give me the skinny on every art book ever written. Michelangelo. You know a lot about him. Life's work, political aspirations, him and the Pope, sexual orientation, the whole works, right? But I bet you can't tell me what it smells like in the Sistine Chapel. You've never actually stood there and looked up at that beautiful ceiling. Seen that? If I asked you about women, you'd probably give me a syllabus of your personal favorites, but you may have been even late a few times, but you can't tell me what it feels like to wake up next to a woman and feel truly happy. And then he goes on and on and about that. Mm Mm-hmm. And he finally gets Matt Damon to open up. God, it's so good. So good. So good. Good Will Hunting. It's a is, lot. Yeah. Apples could have been in there yeah. when he does the whole. Yeah, you know, there's a few. Well, that's more of what a What is it, like $5 of, yeah, in that's, late that, fees at the library? There's back and forth in that one. The monologue is, you know, whatever. Um, all right. And then I'm, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going back to back. I'm going with Robin Williams' Seize the Day monologue in the classroom in Dead Poets Society. Oh, Dead Poets Society. Yeah. You know, that was based on a teacher at UConn. Was it really? Yeah. <clears throat> I took his class. What do you think about having... I'm not in going... Five, in five picks, having same actor as two of your five picks. It's lazy. <laughs> it's fine. No, they're <laughs> classics. <laughs> I'm joking. They are, they are on I've got four like, of how the you best monologues <laughs> yeah. ever in any movie. The <laughs> Billy Madison. <laughs> You've got... All right. The inches model. All right. All right. Four. I'm going Animal House. Oh, which one? Pluto Speech. Okay. <laughs> Pluto Speech. Famous. I mean, I haven't seen that movie in you years. Gone. Oh, I, years. I, so I don't even I don't even have like a vague recollection. When the Germans it. when the Germans bomb Pearl Harbor, the end. Oh. Gotta keep rolling. Don't remember. You didn't want to go with the zit one? Really? <laughs> no, we could have. We could have. I feel like this is. I feel like this is the. Uh, this is the sort of crux of the movie. Is is this speech at the end? Okay. With my fourth pick, we're gonna go Samuel Jackson in Pulp Fiction. Mm. Good one. Yeah, there's like probably nine. Yeah. Yeah. multiple that we could choose from. I was thinking the one where he's like, English motherfucker, do you speak it? <laughs> that was more the scene I was. Going I like it. <laughs> I don't think anybody's picked anything bad here. No. No, I think this is a pretty good. Good. Yeah. There's no crazy dud. I'm yet. waiting for Tommy to get real cute. Yeah, I might do it. Around. I might do it. Just I have a play at the end. So. All right, let's close it out. Close it out. All right. This is for all the women listening <laughs> America Ferrara and Barbie. Mm. We can't you say have to be We have to just be thin, good. but not too thin. Yeah. You can never say. You want to be thin. You have to say you want to be healthy, but you also have to be thin. Anyway, her monologue was amazing in that movie. Got her, it got her an Oscar done. Yeah. Amazing. So meaningful. I like it. That's a pretty solid. I feel good about pretty it. Pretty crazy list. Checked all my boxes. It's a solid draft. So 
not surprised. Are we going to do honorable always... mention at the end? Yeah, yeah we, can do honorable mention. we have to. <laughs> yeah. All, All right. right, my fifth, my fifth one. My oh. issue is like I have another sports one, mm-hmm. and I feel like I already started. And and I, this is not a sports <clears throat> speech draft, but mm-hmm. I feel like it's not a perfect film, but it's a perfect scene in a good film and an underrated film. Okay, Timo and Coach Carter. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Climax of that film. Mm-hmm. I feel like the whole, I feel like Samuel has like a lot of great moments uh. in that movie. And I feel like that part of it is a, is, is what you want in a film monologue. It's mm-hmm. what you want in a, in a scene like that. And so I'm taking it off. I love it. I think, um, I think what's interesting is I was like trying to make choices here and, and listen to you guys pick these, like you guys pick things that I would never have picked never in a million years and it doesn't make it wrong i think we can all agree on that yeah the thing with movies is nearly every every film ever made has dialogue and in every film there's key points of a monologue and you could literally pick something from nearly every film that's what i'm realizing now yeah you have to pick no one a uh, no one thing for the fifth one. You cannot. <laughs> this is like if you I mean, don't I was thinking of a couple yeah, of rounds. If you don't if pick. you don't do it, I feel like people are gonna leave this thing like All extremely. Right, let's let's go. What do you think it's gonna be? What, I, I what, it, it is a Nolan film. I, I yeah. waited to the fifth round because I, well I can enough. always find value in the fifth I'm just round. trying to think My about I'm trying to think about what, what, what scene in Interstellar would fit this the most. Oh, Interstellar. Interstellar has like there's like four or five I've never seen it. Okay. I would guess. I don't want to step on it, though. All right. I'm going to go with uh, Dr. Brand, the daughter, uh, not the Michael Caine's character. Um, they are having a, a discussion about um, her um, her infatuation and love for Dr. Wolf and his planet, but they don't have enough fuel to get there. And they start talking about the idea of love as being this observable thing. And the movie Interstellar Mm -hmm. is really just about love. Mm. In some ways, love is a dimension that we can't observe or quantify, right? Here's the monologue. Maybe it means something more, something we can't yet understand. Maybe it's some evidence, some artifact of a higher dimension that we can't consciously perceive. I'm drawn across the universe to someone I haven't seen in a decade who I know is probably dead. Love is the one thing we're capable of perceiving that transcends dimensions of time and space. Maybe we should trust that even if we can't understand it. So all right, Cooper, yes, the tiniest possibility of seeing Wolf again excites me. That doesn't mean I'm wrong. Mm. It's pretty good. Pretty good. Let's go. Let's Break go. That out. Let's it was also go. the lead up. Did you, consider, nice did, lead you, up. did you consider the rage rage? Is that oh, I did. I is did. that considered a monologue? Um, On this draft. It's a it poem. It's a poem from Dylan Thomas. So it's it's kind of hard to like include that. The other one I considered was, fuck, I wrote it down. Oh, here we go. Uh, he, when he's sitting on the porch and he's talking to his father-in-law. And he's like, uh, he's like, we're still pioneers. We barely begun. Our greatest accomplish- accomplishments cannot be behind us because our destiny lies above us. But I felt like that was more of a quote than a monologue. I, this is the question I had about Michael Caine in Nolan movies is to your point earlier about dialogue. It feels like half of his dialogue could be considered like uh, some men just want to watch the world burn. That isn't a yeah, monologue yeah, 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 yeah. necessarily, but it's like yeah. the difference between a monologue and just like a quotable yeah. of like, oh yeah, that was just a bomb line mm-hmm. that sticks with you, but is not the same thing as, uh, oh, it's yeah, like, like an, an interlude ongoing. where you're dropping. Yeah. Where you're All right, dropping let's, go some, let's go with some obvious um, omissions and honorable mentions. Okay. Do you have any, Sue? I don't know if these are obvious, Okay, but this is like my all time, one of my all time favorite moments in a movie. Matthew McConaughey. Time to kill the final oh, yeah. scene in the courtroom. Now imagine she's white. Oh, he does yeah. the, I mean, yeah, yeah. that I, I, the only reason why is I was, like I said, I was trying to check, like try to do a little, you know, comedy over here, yeah. meaningful over there, yeah. and sports over there. So a few good men was kind of like, it was between those two. And I, I went a few good men because I thought you guys were going to swoop it. So I had to take it first. Okay. <laughs> I, like it. I had a, uh, I had old school Frank's debate where he blacks out. <laughs> <laughs> I also had uh, "It's a Wonderful Life" that model. It was too corny uh, to pick. Yeah. But that's a that's a classic it's one. Good. I mean, there's it's a classic good. one. Smudging the temperature. <laughs> I wanted some more negative ones. The Rudy one. The Rudy one. I couldn't do because it did, did, did too much sports. But like yeah, the Rudy yeah. one is a moment. Yeah, for sure. 
I had the opening monologue um, in Inglorious Bastards. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then um, the, the most, I, to me, the most obvious a, a mission that we all had, um, and I would have drafted it had someone scooped in and taken my interstellar monologue, is um, William Wallace in Braveheart, the oh, battle scene oh, when he really? gets everybody jacked. Yeah, I just can't pick Mel Gibson. <laughs> like it's like a comp it's a completely good pick. You just yeah. can't. Be, I just don't want him in the five. Yeah. Okay. I had one more rando. Okay, I want to hear it. And I didn't do it because I was. You guys would have not. I feel like you're not feeling it. But devil, uh, devil wears Prada. No, this, this is a really in blue. This is a good one. I mean, she has a ton of monologues in there. Yeah, that you I just from. we just Maybe did a, monologues, we but. just did a draft with Jaime Jaquez of mm -hmm. movie villains, and I picked her. Oh, you picked her. Okay. So I was like, I didn't want. I can't so do that twice, hit. or it's too much. But like that is that is a. Uh, stuff. This what, what stuff. else? What else is going on with you besides uh, guest appearances on the Old Man and Three Draft and <laughs> wrapping up season one of Sue's Places? Yeah, a lot's been going on. Um, it's been announced that I'm now a part of the Seattle Storm Ownership Group, so I'm really excited about Congratulate. that. Congratulate! Let's get a round of applause uh, yeah. for that. Let's go! Let's go. <laughs> Very excited. Um, yeah, I mean, I tried to be uh, as disruptive as possible as a player. It's a little different on the ownership side, but I know I can keep. Uh, you know, keep my fingerprints on things. So it's cool. I love it. Yeah. I love, I love the you. I love the ownership on one side and then the media empire that is <laughs> growing. And you should tell tell everyone about this stuff with Megan. Because I feel yeah. like you guys are just getting started. Yeah, we're just getting started. Um, Megan and I have a production company at Touch More. It actually, I mean, we, you know, introduced it to the world like over a year ago, but Megan was still playing. We hadn't really, you know, we hadn't really gotten into the weeds yet. But now we're starting to. So we just uh, announced that we um are taking a book. It's called Cleat Cute, Cleat like soccer cleats, and turning that into a TV show. So we're really excited about that. And then both Megan and I, we've been doing a touch more live a little bit more. That was like our Instagram live show yeah, during yeah. the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. yeah you were, you were on, on it. You made a guest appearance, a little cameo. I think Jimmy was on it. Yeah, yeah, Jimmy yeah. That was, was when we had you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we started to do, we did, we've done like two of them now. Um, one of them was, was more public facing. And, you know, as it turns out, we have pretty good chemistry when we're talking about these things. And it's a way for us to, you know what happens when, I mean, you obviously know this, both of you, you especially, when you're not playing anymore, you don't have a microphone in your face anymore. And you don't get to express your opinions mm -hmm. in the ways that you want to, or maybe you see something and you're like, oh, I wish I could, you know? And I think Megan and I are obviously uniquely positioned given all of our experiences. And so now we're just putting the mic back in our faces so we can talk about topics, but also have fun with it, right? It's to keep it engaging, keep it light, keep it fun, bring great, uh, great guests on, but also talk about topics that are topical. Very cool. Yeah. Um, Sometimes I wish there wasn't a microphone. In front of my yeah. face. <laughs> now I'm just so used to it. You know? Now I'm just so used to it. Sue, fun as always. Thanks yeah. for stopping by. Sure.